Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Right. So we're going to start again, so I will invite you to take your seat. And um, our next speaker is Pushmit Kohli. Kohli is in the Microsoft Research Lab here in Redmond, and prior to that in Cambridge. And I think you've even been in the one in India uh, years ago. Yeah. So it's a real, real pleasure to have Pushmit here with us. He works on the development of intelligent machines to teach computers to understand the behavior and intent of humans and to correctly interpret, perceive, or see objects and scenes depicted in color, depth, images, or video. So I think just from that you can guess he comes from computer vision. And uh, he actually worked, so he moved to Redmond recently, well recently, I guess a year ago, where he worked uh, with uh, Rick Rashid as his uh, technical assistant. And uh, since February, he's actually starting a new AI team. So, great, we have now a cognition team at Microsoft. So let's welcome uh, Pushmit, please. So uh, thanks, uh, Evelyn, for the, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to give this talk. So um, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, excitement about deep learning and AI and machine learning. Like every sort of day, uh, no day goes, uh, goes past where you don't hear uh, an article from the New York Times or the Washington Post or the BBC talking about some cool sort of uh, AI project and then we, we listen to uh, experts saying, oh, AI will take over and uh, sort of uh, it, it will be a threat to humanity and so on. So behind all this sort of hype, what, is, uh, what are the real sort of challenges and what do we really need to sort of uh, resolve? So. Um, I'm, uh, I'm my approach to sort of machine learning and AI research is very pragmatic. I started off uh, as a, a verification systems person, power methods person. Like when I joined MSR uh, 12 or 13 years back, uh, it, it was in the software engineering group, uh, sort of testing of sort of device drivers and so on. And then uh, moved into discrete optimization, computer vision, perception, game theory, uh, machine learning, deep learning, probabilistic programming, and so on. So I've had a chance to sort of uh, reflect upon the developments happening in various areas of computer science, not just in machine learning. So this is sort of, in, in some sense, uh, inspired from the experiences uh, uh, throughout th those years. And what I see are some of the challenges that uh, all these machine learning sort of uh, systems will face when they end up uh, being deployed. So to start off, there is a reason to be very cheerful, right? Uh, there have been a number of great successes. We have uh, real-world systems uh, like Skype Translator, which uh, like 10 or 15 years ago would not have been imaginable, right? Uh, uh, a system being able to, in real time, translate speech into uh, first uh, a text, convert it, convert the text, and then generate speech again, right? That's a, that's a pretty impressive feat. We have self-driving cars, although we know what are the challenges there. We have systems like the Kinect sensor, which can, a single sensor can estimate uh, the human pose of the person, right, in real time. We know uh, the advances in object detection, and object classification, uh, now these types of systems can outperform a human on these perceptual tasks. We all heard about AlphaGo and, of course, uh, the Atari games uh, work from DeepMind. So behind all these sort of successes, uh, which uh, are a great sort of success for the community, there are also n a number of stumbles, right? So we have the racist, uh, so the, the gorilla gate, as I call it. We had Tay, right? Uh, and then we had the Tesla crash, right? And the question is, was it really surprising? Was it really surprising to the community that these things would happen? Like m many people were, were expecting this to happen in some sense, right? Uh, are software systems 
if you look at the history of software, we all sort of remember the blue screen of death <laughs> when, it, when it used to happen. Um, but in some sense, software was always plagued like this. And suddenly, we, we think that, oh, humans were writing this software, this co or the, these sort of uh, thousands of lines of codes or millions of lines of code, and we were able to not uh, get, uh, and we were able to resolve all, all the bugs. But so suddenly, if a machine uh, sort of writes this, this program, then all these sort of bugs will, will go away. Well, that's not true, as we have already sort of discovered. So the question that I think about is, uh, how do we sort of solve this? Right? One example is, uh, how brittle are we? What, what, what are the foundational sort of things that we are building these systems on top of? Right? So this is the example uh, from, again, folks at NYU and Google, and uh, shows that here is a state-of-the-art image classification system, which correctly identifies the correct label for the left side of the images. These images, and these images, if, if were given, a, uh, given as an input to the system, would correctly sort of classify what the objects are. And if you add some random sort of very minimal perturbations and create these new images, suddenly everything becomes a ostrich. So the label the system would give you is an ostrich for all these three, all these three images. That seems crazy. Like, forget about intelligent systems. This is like the most stupid system I've ever come across, right? And we are, we, are, we, are, we are cheering this. We are writing New York Times articles on this. That's, a, that's the most stupidest thing I've ever heard or seen, right? So this is the, the current state of the art. This is the current state of the art. I'm not making this up. This is like uh, this, uh, the papers mention these sort of results. So now it's clear that there are a number of challenges. So of course, we should be proud about, uh, about all the developments that have happened in the field. But we should also be thinking about these sort of issues. right? And behind all those accidents and all the sort of uh, the racist uh, uh, sort of bots and uh, photo classifiers are these fundamental limitations in the machinery. So let's think as scientists do and look at the crux of the problem, right? So when we encountered these problems while developing software, what did we do? So MSR, for example, invested a lot in software verification. Back in the day, like, uh, like uh, when I started in, uh, uh, as an intern like uh, in 2004, uh, the software engineering group was huge. And it was basically, uh, my first project was testing device drivers for Longhorn. And it was a, uh, Longhorn basically what went uh, to be uh, uh, Windows. Uh, yeah. So it, it, was, it, was, it was a big deal, right, testing these systems. And so what do we, what sort of the machinery we will need to build to test these systems? So the questions in my mind are, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, what is the programming language we are going to use for, de for developing these systems? Are we, are, are, do you think we will still be using C Sharp, C++, Java, or like Torch, TensorFlow? What, what will be that language? What, what type of debuggers will it come with? What sort of compilers will it co come with? What sort of visualization techniques it will come with? Right? 20 years from now, like, will we be still doing C++? or MATLAB or whatnot, right, to, to, to run these experiments? That's the question. And how do you then verify these things? Should we, will we be using unit testing, integration testing? How do we even quantify what we are testing against? Software has high-level specifications. And then we basically test the implementations on the basis of those high-level specifications. In, in the case of machine learning, we only have partial specifications, input-output pairs, the things that are given to machine learning systems are partial specifications of the behavior that is expected of these systems. And not even partial, they are noisy partial specifications because sometimes we don't even know that the labels are correct. Okay? So let's look at the software engineering version of it. So we were given high-level specification. You go to a software engineer and say, here's a high-level specification of what I want you to sort of build. And then they build the implementation and then you test whether your, the implementation has the properties 
as specified in the high level specification. The machine learning system has to now, uh, we can sort of, the only way to test uh, is on the partial specification. So that's what our test data is a partial, pa uh, partial specification and we have a bunch of tests that we, we can only sort of uh, uh, do statistical sort of guarantees. There are no formal sort of th uh, proofs that we can give about the properties of, uh, of the machine learning system. Okay, so how do we now sort of resolve this issue? How do we resolve this issue? And then what supervision should we sort of use? Should we just use, should we continue to just use this uh, partial noisy specification, which is uh, input output pairs? Or is there certain sort of properties, these sort of uh, uh, Asimov's uh, laws of robotics that we need to ingrain in? Or what is the formal structure of how do we actually embed these uh, types of supervision or invariants into the mapping, right? So these are the questions that I'm particularly interested in, okay? So let's look at the second question first about data. So I, I, like if, I, if we had time, we could, I could have shown you a, a very uh, interesting post, uh, a video from Yes Prime Minister. Uh, it's a British sort of, uh, a comedy sort of program in which uh, uh, the bureaucrats explain to the minister about surveys, right? So you essentially keep on asking the question in a different way until you get the right response, which is what people are blaming Brexit for. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, the, but the idea, but the, the question remains, right? If you look at the data, how data is collected to train these systems, we know you in social sciences that there are big biases. There are framing biases, and then there are subject biases, right? So uh, in behavioral econ econ uh, economics, we know that many sort of empirical theories have been tested on undergrads at MIT or Harvard because that's where, where faculty sort of uh, try to test these things, right? But you cannot expect uh, the same sort of things to hold true from some sort of random person from India or China or South Africa who comes from a completely different social uh, sort of background. They might not basically give you the same uh, results when, uh, when you ask them the same question as a MIT undergrad or a Harvard undergrad or a Yale undergrad or, uh, or a Chicago undergrad, right? So we, how do you basically uh, sort of uh, collect data and how do you basically, how does it affect uh, the, the, uh, the performance of these systems? So I will basically just sh show you one example of how this happens in the case of gesture recognition. So the problem is uh, you want to build a gesture recognition system. You want to collect data to make the machine understand whether a person is sort of, um, uh, throwing an object or want to increase the volume of uh, uh, the music player or want to move to the next track or something like that, right? So here's a bunch of uh, uh, things that we did. We invited 30 people into the lab and this is the time when we were building uh, uh, sort of uh, the Kinect gesture recognition system and we wanted to get training data for different types of gestures like uh, these, these were gaming gestures but were also uh, music player gestures. So a gaming gestures would be throw sort of uh, something, duck, uh, or uh, kick, uh, or uh, music player gestures would be increase the volume, or to move to the next track, and so on, right? So uh, how do we sort of uh, get data for to train the machine learning system that when they see that these movements, then they should uh, sort of think that this is the gesture that the human wants to perform. And so there were uh, different types of modalities that uh, we could sort of think about. So first of all, we can tell the, uh, the people, okay, this is in, in text, this is the thing that you, you should do. What will be the gesture you should do uh, for moving to the next track, right? So uh, this is uh, one of the things that we, we said, raise your arm to uh, increase the volume, right? And some people did uh, this, some people did this, some people did this, some people, there's a lot of variation, right? So then somebody said, okay, don't, uh, that's so ambiguous, let's use images, right? So in the case of images, uh, you could, uh, we basically said, okay, to, in order to go to the next track, what you need to do is basically, uh, here's a bunch of uh, sort of canonical poses. This is like uh, you would see in manuals for, uh, while, uh, while traveling on flights, they will say these are the set of poses that you need to be in. So you need to be in this pose, this pose, this pose, this pose, and there's the arrow saying you, essentially need to do this gesture, right, to move to the next track. And 60% of the people did it correctly, 
the rest basically did this. Did this. <laughs> right? So it's crazy, right? So there was still ambiguity. So then people said, oh, you just, just collect videos of people doing it, right? You should just basically uh, give them instructions, give, uh, give a canonical sort of uh, video, show them a video, and then let them do the gesture. So one of the gestures was uh, increase uh, uh, sort of uh, the tempo of the music. And the way to do it, to just do this, right? And the tempo of the music will basically increase. And so I had an intern who uh, was collecting all these instructions for the participants. And he made a video of himself and then showed the video to uh, uh, all the participants and uh, recorded what they were doing. And when we looked at the data, all of them had one hand in their pocket, and then they were doing this. Now, the one hand in the pocket is not needed, right? But it, the, the intern was, had one hand in the pocket, so they just copied the whole thing. So it, it shows you how difficult it is to get training data, and how difficult it is to sort of look at, uh, to even instruct people to collect data, right? So, uh, and, so, and it actually makes a big difference. So this is the, 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 uh, the gesture recognition performance. If you collect data by showing textual instructions, this is by uh, images, this is by videos, and this is by images plus text and videos plus text. So it, this basically has a significant uh, sort of effect on the final uh, output of the, of the, uh, the system. So, uh, and, and, and the effect is different for different types of uh, gestures. So for the music player gestures, you saw that videos and videos plus text were very important. In the case of games where the gestures people already knew, there was less ambiguity, right? Kick, there is no sort of, there's only one type of kick. People know what, what uh, to do with a kick. In those cases, basically, uh, just having images or text was, was fine, right? Videos did not add that much. So this is the question, right, that we are always looking at, uh, when we are collecting this data, we are looking at a uh, few people, right, few subjects. Uh, uh, behavioral economists were doing this, also computer scientists are doing this. Uh, but we need to sort of look at people, a, a larger crowd of people, and to make sure that, they, uh, that these systems are able to uh, uh, sort of conform to those preferences. So we did another study here. We were doing a recommendation system. And the idea was that uh, when, we, when we look at uh, recommending, um, uh, say, what type of uh, program a person should watch, we base, base it on individual preferences. But that is uh, not necessarily true, because people generally watch things with other people. So this is the preferences if, say, an individual male was watching television alone. Right, so you will see general documentary comes up high, news comes high, general drama comes high. An individual female, sort of general drama comes high, news comes high, situational comedy comes high, and so on, right? Now, uh, any idea on what happens when uh, you have an all-male group? What will come high? Absolutely, right? It's, it's different, right? It's a different bias, right? It, it, it depends on, basically, who are you with? So it, it also uh, changes the context in which the data is collected. Uh, or, or when two females are watching things together? Hmm? General drama sort of comes high, but like, it does not change much, right? But these things are not uh, sort of, uh, uh, these things have to be studied. But, but what happens when there is a mixed gender group? <laughs> no, the, 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 the female sort of preferences dominate. <laughs> so, 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 but th these are interesting sort of questions, right? Like when we think about individual preferences, when we think about recommendation systems, we, we will just look at individual uh, sort of training data and just feed it to the, to the classifier or, or re recommendation system, right? It does not take into account what are the complex dynamics that are in play uh, uh, when a, a group is making a decision together. OK, then like I can go on and on about basically this uh, uh, stuff. So now coming, coming to the center, uh, other part, like how do, you, how do you sort of 
create tools or programming interfaces to actually build very complicated perception or intelligent systems. So here is one uh, sort of example problem that we could uh, think of. So, um, so suppose you want to uh, solve computer vision. One way of solving computer vision is to say, I have a sort of a rendering engine, right? I have a graphics uh, engine, which given some representation of the world, gives me the image, right? It creates the image. And then in order to understand the image, what I just need to do is basically solve this inverse problem to recover the parameters of the world, right? So the idea is that I will, uh, I've, been, I've been shown some image x, and I have this rendering function, so I will try out different parameters, different uh, things about the world, until I get to a point which sort of matches the observed image, and th that's what I will output. That is the representation I will output. So many very interesting problems can be formulated in, in this sort of way, uh, including camera pose estimation, where the rendering engine is just, you're doing a raycast, right? You have a, a sort of a 3D model, you have a, a sort of camera position, and then you can create the depth uh, image. And then the, the inverse problem is, given the depth image, you want to uh, generate uh, the camera uh, position, right? The, the, uh, the 3D position of the camera, or the 60 position of the camera, the 3D position, as well as the orientation. You can do it for human pose estimation, where you are given some 40-dimensional representation or 26-dimensional representation of the human pose. You can generate the image, and then uh, to solve the uh, uh, pose estimation problem, you're solving the inverse problem. So the problem with this approach has been that it is very interpretable, right? It's uh, like this mapping is actually known. This is written by human, right? This is, a this is sort of a rendering engine which is uh, uh, written by human. And so this is very well specified. The mapping from outputs to inputs is very well specified. But in, in the same way, the, the mapping, also, uh, it's also providing a specification for the input-output mapping, right? So here the specification is very well, well uh, uh, specified, but it's very difficult to actually optimize it, right, in order to get to the back mapping. So the way we, we did it is we had some way, uh, a number of sort of uh, different techniques. We said, okay, if this um, optimization problem is hard, why don't we just basically uh, use machine learning to generate hints? And from those hints, we will start local gradient descent, right? That's the sort of technique that we used uh, for, for Connect. In fact, in fact, we went further. We said, why not just, why use just one hint? We can use a bunch of hints, right? And uh, at least one of them will be good. And then there was a lot of machine learning as to how do you uh, sort of generate these multiple hints, such that at least one of them will be good. Uh, and it, it sort of uh, all worked, right? We had uh, systems which in real time could uh, get you results like this. You have a depth image, and you could classify the body parts, and you could estimate the, uh, uh, the body part positions. So this sort of system worked. But the challenge is now, and of course, uh, I can show you another example. This is uh, something that Eric was- It's a rig template model of the hand. Yeah, this is how the computer will sound in 20 years. But <laughs> no, uh, so um, the, the idea is here are the proposals that uh, the computer is being shown, right? So it's shown this sort of image, and it quickly finds out which is the right one. Um, the initial sort of prediction you will see uh, by uh, that the, uh, the the program produces those those samples. The best of those samples is not that great, right? But after sort of uh, and you can sort of see the reconstruction error. But after refinement, it will uh, now look much better. I'm sorry, I'm just confused when you're saying you can see the reconstruction. Could you tell us what each of those images are? So this is the depth image that is shown, that is given to the input, that is given to the system. And uh, let me just go back. So this is the model that we are trying to fit to the observation, the ob observed image. So what happens is you are shown this image, and a bunch of uh, proposals are generated by the system, right? And the best one is, 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 uh, is selected. This is showing the best one, right? That is, that is proposed by uh, the system. Now this proposal will be uh, improved by local refinement using the gradient descent step that I was, uh, I was, I was mentioning, right? So, uh, and this is showing the uh, how the sort of uh, fitted 
model uh, overlaid on top of uh, the observation. So is the green the observation or is the red? The red is the observation, right? And the green is the fitted model, okay? And now this, these are sort of the results that you get from the system. And you can see that it is really robust because it's now not relying on tracking. It is at every moment, it's generating a lot of proposals and it's able to sort of fit those proposals correctly. So at one point of time, uh, Jem, uh, he, like he, remove, he changed the lighting condition and still the, uh, still the system was working. And uh, at one point of time, he will just now uh, uh, go out of his office and still the thing would uh, would be working, even though like uh, at this point of time, his hand probably occupies only around 30 or 40 pixels. So this sort of uh, method is very, very robust. And it works on a variety of different sort of uh, 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 subjects and so on. So the question now is that required a lot of engineering, right? That required sort of uh, 100 man years of work to actually get, get it to that stage. How do we do this for arbitrary sort of uh, systems? So, so uh, the, we were generating this sort of pipeline. So uh, the forward mapping was given, the generative, uh, the, the rendering engine, and then the back mapping required creation of these portfolio of discriminative predictors, which each proposed a proposal, uh, and then which were, which were refined. So can you now build a programming language or a, a new pro type of programming language which just formalizes this? You write the generative process, you provide the specification, the, the back mapping in one way, and the, in, and, the, and the backward sort of process is automatically generated as like a, comp, uh, like, a, uh, like a compiler. So we had this paper last year which won the best paper, which was the runner for the best paper award at CVPR. It's called a Picture, a Probabilistic Programming Language for Scene Perception, where you have an approximate, uh, so you have a language, you have a way of specifying the world and then you have a renderer which uh, sort of takes in that representation of the world and generates an image. And then, uh, then there is basically this compilation stage which takes in the observed image and learns what will be the, the right mechanics to invert that process, okay? Uh, this is another sort of uh, direction which uh, sort of aids interpretability, which is, there's a lot of work on representation learning. Like whenever we are operating on high dimensional signals, the idea is to somehow convert them into a low dimensional, either through a PCA, through a sort of linear mapping or a non-linear mapping, uh, uh, because it aids uh, sort of supervised machine learning from there on. But suppose uh, we want this intermediate representation to be disentangled as well. If it is disentangled, it's super useful. For example, in this case, uh, suppose you have images of faces and uh, and the, so it's a 150 by 150 uh, image of a face, and you want a 200 dimensional representation. Of course, you can do a PCA and just look at the first uh, 200 eigenvectors, right? 200 eigenvalues to encode uh, the the actual uh, image. But those uh, eigenvalues would not correspond to any semantic concept. Suppose you want to disentangle that vector and say that the first 10 dimensions correspond to pose. The second 10 dim dimensions correspond to light. The last sort of 50 dimensions correspond to the shape of the face, right? That would be super useful. Why? Because now, once you have this representation, suppose I want to do different types of tasks, uh, say face identification. I know that for face identification, only the shape matters, right? The pose or lighting condition should not matter. If I'm sort of comparing two uh, faces and saying two images and saying whether they uh, belong to the same person or not, only this part really matters. The other parts don't matter. So I can sort of just use the representation that I want. Similarly, if I want to do gesture recognition, then all this, is, all this information is nuisance. I just need to use the first 10 dimensions. So finding a supervised mapping from these 10 dimensions to the post space is much more sort of efficient than uh, finding the mapping from a 200 dimensional sort of feature vector to the post space, okay? So this sort of, this, these sort of disentangled representations are very sort of uh, useful. So, uh, so suppose we train this data and uh, th this model and we, we show how to train this model. Then given a new image, if you have a single image, you can take this representation and just perturb one piece of it and see what is the output that you generate. So here's one single image, right? And we get this intermediate representation for this single image using this encoder and then perturb one piece of it and see what is the generated output. 
So this when you change sort of the pose in the, uh, the z-axis, right? So this sort of thing is done. This is when you change the illumination in x. This is when you sort of change the pose in sort of the y-axis. So the, the model has not seen any of the, the things uh, from other dimensions, other directions, or other sort of illumination, but it is still able to disentangle and, and hallucinate what the, uh, what the data should look like. There's also some other work that uh, people have started uh, sort of doing in the, in the computer vision community and even in the natural language community is to build these uh, sort of do question answering. Say, if, is there a red shape above, above a circle in this image? Uh, by a sort of not solving that problem directly as an end-to-end -end classifier, but building modules, which are then sort of composed together to answer the question. And each of these modules can be unit tested in some sense, right? And the idea is if you can sort of test these, uh, uh, these, uh, these units separately, then their compositions can also be correct. So there is some interesting work that is sort of happening in this space. So um, how much time do I have? Okay. So just to sort of uh, conclude uh, by mentioning uh, a, a point that uh, was mentioned in during Eric's talk regarded, regarding game theory. Uh, so traditionally, machine learning systems have been uh, considered as the following. You are given an input, and you're given a set of outputs, and you're trying to learn the parameters of, uh, of the machine, right, of the machine learning system. But that's not how it is going to happen in the future. In the future, the machines are going to constantly learn from humans, right? And humans are not constant. They are like humans are not a stationary distribution, right? They will basically uh, sort of they, they, the preferences change uh, over time, uh, the social norms uh, change over time, uh, what the society considers as normal changes over time, and so on, right? So in fact, this user population also has some parameters. And it has also evolved, and it's also even going to react to the developments that, this, that, that are happening in the intelligent systems. So it's about co-adaptation or co-learning of these systems, right? Where you also have to think about what is going to, how are the users going to be affected, right? And how should I basically think about it even before I start making changes to my parameters, right? So that's sort of, it goes into really deep questions of equilibrium analysis uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, so uh, by that, I mean, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying it's a very exciting time for machine learning, but there are a lot of challenges that we need to be careful about and we need to give a lot of thought uh, to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Okay. Oh. So I'm trying to understand you 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 specified some high level goals and then you started talking about sort of an individual project and so I'm trying to understand like are you trying to come up with some sort of completely new kind of formalized methods for designing training sets? Or uh, I'm, I'm still not clear. You, you had this vision, like we, we did all this stuff with programming, now we're gonna do it for machine learning. And then you went into a lot of stuff about how the training sets are very hard to design properly. So what what is the link here? Yeah, so what, uh, so what I started off with is basically sort of trying to motivate uh, where do where are the challenges in deploying machine learning systems, right? Or even understanding machine learning systems. And so uh, one approach that I could take is basically, okay, let's throw all the research uh, in machine learning out and sort of restart from scratch and build and take the right pieces. The other sort of approach is basically say, what are the things that people are already doing in machine learning? Right, which uh, which try to address some of the concerns. For example, the question of interpretability, the question of sort of uh, making sure that the specifications uh, that there is some high-level specification uh, in mind that the the mapping needs to conform to. So, for example, the the idea the the thing that I uh, talked about with regards to the human pose estimation uh, part uh, or the hand pose estimation part. There, one side, the forward process, 
the process from the, the, the joint angles to generating the image. That is a very well specified and well understood mapping, right? Because it's, it's like a rendering engine that has been hand specified, it has been written by a software engineer, right? So that mapping is perfectly well defined. The specification is very clear, but that's not the mapping we are interested in. We are interested in the reverse mapping. Given the image, what is the pose, right? But this mapping, the mapping from sort of pose to images provides a specification. It provides what sh the back mapping should be because we can now generate infinite data to test the, to test the reverse mapping, right? So the idea is, okay, can we now uh, generate high level specifications for all the problems we are interested in? Maybe not, absolutely, right? So, so it's, it's a question of how do we uh, sort of provide, if we are going to work with machine learning, the machine learning uh, that we see today, most of it is works with partial specifications. Partial specification in the form of input output pairs, right? Of course, there is, there is uh, new types of specification, which is uh, if you have a simulated world, right, and you have to sort of create a task, that's also one form of specification of, of behavior that you would, uh, that's more of a goal-directed uh, sort of uh, a form of specification of behavior, right? Not, it's not in the, in the form of input-output pairs. So the, the idea is, can we now uh, sort of uh, go towards uh, the, uh, the time where we will be able to marry the concepts that have been developed in the software engineering world in testing uh, and verifying the behavior of software systems, very large software systems, and can we sort of uh, make machine learning, uh, make them tra uh, uh, translate those things in the machine learning world, right? And I was giving you some examples of how we did it for, say, Connect, or uh, sort of some of the initial sort of work in uh, for Picture, but that's not solving the whole problem. It's just giving you a taste of what it, uh, it would look like, uh, or an example of how it sort of works. With regards to data, that's a different matter altogether. It's about saying that even generating a partial specification has its own challenges. How do you know that you are, how do you generate specifications uh, anyways for the task that you are trying to solve, right? So even, even generating a partial specification is problematic because of the framing and subject biases. So when a system de designer basically goes in and says, okay, I want to build a pose estimation system or a gesture recognition system, and it's supposed to work uh, in Japan as well as the US and the UK and India, where people have various different notions of uh, uh, sort of movements and so on, like where do we start, right? So, so it's, it's all about basically specifications. How do you, if machine learning today is working with uh, partial specifications, input output pairs, then how do you generate them properly, right? In the future, we might want, we would hope that we might be able to have more richer or more sort of stronger notions of specifications, right? So we can test those systems to say, are you conforming to the specifications? Because today, I don't know what the Tesla system is going to, what, what are the specifications for the Tesla drive, uh, uh, lane uh, sort of uh, uh, assist uh, system, right? Nobody knows, right? It's just based on some input output examples. But how, what are those input, uh, from which distribution are those input output examples uh, sort of sampled from? Who knows, right? There's, there, there must be a lot of biases. Maybe it's all sort of uh, Tesla's driving around Elon Musk's uh, house, right? <laughs> or uh, the highways around his sort of, uh, around Silicon Valley. So it's, uh, that's, that's the, the, the real sort of problem. That's why basically I wanted to just also mention some of the work on subject biases and framing biases and collecting training data because that sort of, goes to the problem of even the partial specifications that we use, input output pairs, those are even not correct. Hi, Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of based on by training. So when, whenever we look, for example, at the problem that you show with neural networks, you know, that you perturb a little bit some pixels and then you get something completely uh, different. Uh, to me, it sounds like uh, we would actually need to have, you know, some sort of Bayesian model in there or some sort of uh, quantification of the uncertainty and of the, let's say, of the noise that there is in there. And in general, I think that, so my, my point of view is that in general, most of deep learning methods that we see nowadays, they essentially create deterministic, you know, representations from which you cannot really extract information about uh, uncertainty. You don't know if what, you know, that if what you are seeing is really 99% accurate because you have already seen this before or simply because you know there is some strange things in the model 
So I was wondering if uh, uh, how does fit into let's say your your vision. Yeah. <coughs> so being Bayesian is not enough. That's what, that's the answer, right? That the point is, it's not just about modeling uncertainties. It's about having a good notion of what is the model. Because say, uh, I'm doing logistic regression and I'm going to say, I'm going to solve everything with logistic regression. And I am Bayesian because I'm going to use sort of uh, the L2 regularizer over the weights. So I'm Bayesian because I have a prior over the weights. It's not enough, right? Because that prior might not make sense, right? Why does the basically the L2 prior over the weights uh, make uh, any uh, sort of sense? It's, if we, as we are talking about uh, here, it's all about prior distributions, right? Like, uh, uh, but priors defined over more sophisticated mappings uh, or of, or of, of more sophisticated form rather than the general priors that we see in discriminative machine learning, the L2 norms or the L0 norm or the L1 norm. It's about having more, uh, that's why basically uh, like factor graphs are a language for specifying priors, right? Uh, probabilistic programming language is, is basically a language for specifying priors, right? So Bayesian is, being Bayesian is not enough. Uh, uh, sort of having uncertainties is not enough. It's uh, uh, the models will might all uh, might uh, still be misspecified. So we need to also work towards more sophisticated models of the world, right? Of of the of the task that we are sort of trying to solve. So uh, sort of handling uncertainties is is important, but that's not the only thing that we need to uh, uh, consider while looking at this problem. But in the moment where we try to specify more stronger priors, then we also need to make sure that these are correct, which means that we need to know more about the system that we want to learn from, which means that you know, essentially it's sort of a circle. We, we want to have autonomic system because we don't want to have strong priors. Otherwise, we would already have the models there. Yeah, so it's, it's like uh, saying that if we don't have a higher level specification, right, then what is the software system we are building? That, that, so that's basically, there, there, is, there needs to be some sort of domain knowledge. If, if we are to, um, so interpretability in the, in, is in the, in the sense that if we are not able to explain what the system has learned, we need to basically be, be able to explain what the system has learned. Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, uh, why trust the system? You can trust the system based on just statistical guarantees over, over the input-output distribution, but uh, the but you need to have some way of specifying, sort of of interpreting what the model has done, and that comes and there comes the notion of how much uh, what can you sort of say about the behavior of the system, and that's basically where the, the structural priors come in, that I believe that this should be true, by this in this uh, with this probability, with some high probability. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Bushmeet. Thank you. So let's thank our speaker again. <clears throat>